Welcome to the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the second quarter of 2024. Welcome to lesson number seven, Motivated by Hope, ready for teaching on May 18. The author of the series of lessons on the Great Controversy is Pastor Mark Finlay, and your reader this week is Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, May 11. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word. We thank you that in your word we see that Jesus came and he lived and he died, he rose again, and he is there for us on a daily basis. And one day very soon he's coming back, and we thank you for that hope. And this week as we study about the amazing return of Jesus and what it will mean for us, for him, for the whole universe, Lord, we just pray that our hearts will be open to your spiritual work on our lives and that through our families and our local churches and our communities we may be able to share your love and your grace with those around us and today I'd particularly like to pray for Peggy from South Africa from the Hood family in Barbados Irma in Trinidad Michael and Marilyn and Doreen who've asked for requests of prayer Lord I pray that their needs will be satisfied and that their hopes will be in Jesus and that the result of all that will be that when the day Jesus comes, each of us will be ready. I pray in Jesus' dear name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Isaiah chapter 25 and verse 9. And it will be said in that day, Behold, this is our God, we have waited for him, and he will save us. This is the Lord, we have waited for him, we will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Let's read that again, Isaiah 25, verse 9. And it shall be said in that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. The second coming of Jesus is one of the central themes of Scripture. It is a golden thread that runs through the Bible's sacred pages. One scholar has estimated that there are 1,845 references to Christ's second coming in the Old Testament. In the 260 chapters of the New Testament, there are more than 300 references to the return of Christ. One in every 25 verses mentions it. 23 of the 27 New Testament books refer to this great event. After the Reformation in Europe foundered and was hampered by divisions and strife, Protestantism took root in the New World, including the United States, where many sought to pick up the mantle of truth, including the truth about the Second Coming. Among them was a Baptist farmer named William Miller. From his study of the Bible, he believed that Jesus was coming soon, even in his lifetime, and then began preaching that message. Miller started a movement that, though facing a great disappointment, opened up to many people Bible truths that remain relevant to this day. In this week's lesson, we will examine why the second coming of Christ has filled the hearts of believers with joy through the centuries and how we can be ready for that great event. Sunday, May 12, The Promise of His Return The Protestant reformers and the pilgrims who left from Holland for the New World longed for the coming of Jesus. For them, the second coming of Christ was a joyous event that they eagerly anticipated. John Wycliffe looked forward to the coming of Christ as the hope of the Church. Calvin spoke for all the Reformers when he talked of the glorious return of Christ as, of all events, most auspicious. For faithful men and women of God, the second coming of Christ was something to be embraced, not something to be feared. Read John 14, 1-3, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13-18, and Titus 2, verses 11-14. Why did these Bible passages give such hope to Christians through the centuries? 
First of all, John 14, beginning at verse 1. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms, and if that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. And First Thessalonians 4, verses 13 to 18. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. And also Titus 2, beginning at verse 11, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. It is easy to understand why a belief in the second coming of Christ has brought such hope and joy to Bible-believing Christians. It points forward to the end of sickness, suffering and death. It ushers in the end of poverty, injustice and oppression. It anticipates the end of strife, conflict and war. It forecasts a future world of peace, happiness and enduring fellowship with Christ and the redeemed of all ages forever. In The Great Controversy, page 302, we read, The coming of the Lord has been in all ages the hope of his true followers. The Saviour's parting promise upon Olivet that he would come again lightened up the future for his disciples, filling their hearts with joy and hope that sorrow could not quench nor trials dim. Amid suffering and persecution, the appearing of the great God and our Saviour Jesus Christ was the blessed hope. When the Thessalonian Christians were filled with grief as they buried their loved ones who had hoped to live to witness the coming of the Lord, Paul, their teacher, pointed them to the resurrection to take place at the Saviour's advent. Then the dead in Christ should rise and together with the living be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And so, he said, shall we ever be with the Lord Wherefore, comfort one another with these words, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 to 18, end of quote. And so, to finish today, why is the second coming so important to our faith? Especially because we know that the dead sleep, as we'll see in Lesson 10, why does this teaching take on such importance? Without it, Why would we be, as Paul said, in an utterly hopeless situation? As you read in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 15 to 18. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins, then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. Monday, May 13, Anticipating the Time 
Although the Protestant reformers believed in the literal, visible, audible and glorious return of Christ, gradually the understanding of this biblical truth changed. Popular 19th century preachers taught that Christ would come to establish his kingdom on earth and usher in 1,000 years of peace. This led to spiritual lethargy and an apathetic commitment to spiritual values. Similarly, Christ's disciples misunderstood the nature of the Messiah's coming. They thought that he would come as a conquering general who would break the yoke of Roman bondage, not one who would deliver them from the condemnation and shackles of sin. Thus, they failed to understand the manner of his coming. Read Acts chapter 1, verses 9 to 11, Revelation 1, 7, and Matthew 24, verses 27, 30, and 31. What do these verses teach us about the manner of our Lord's return? Acts chapter 1, beginning at verse 9. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men, dressed in white, stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. And Revelation 1 verse 7, look, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all peoples on earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. And then Matthew chapter 24 verse 27, for as lightning that comes from the east is visible even in the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. And then verses 30 and 31. Then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then all the peoples of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heavens to the other. When Christ came the first time as a babe in Bethlehem's manger, very few people discerned his coming. But when he comes the second time, every eye will see him come. Every ear will hear the trumpet blast of his return. Every human being on earth will behold his glory. We need not be deceived. The scriptures have made the events surrounding his return abundantly clear. In The Great Controversy, page 299, we read, One of the most solemn and yet most glorious truths revealed in the Bible is that of Christ's second coming to complete the great work of redemption. To God's pilgrim people, so long left to sojourn in the region and shadow of death, a precious, joy-inspiring hope is given in the promise of His appearing, who is the resurrection and the life, to bring home again His banished. The doctrine of the Second Advent is the very keynote of the sacred scriptures. From the day when the first pair turned their soaring steps from Eden, the children of faith have waited the coming of the promised one to break the destroyer's power and bring them again to the lost paradise. End of quote. An early Adventist leader, Luther Warren, used to tell young people, The only way to be ready for the coming of Christ is to get ready and stay ready. The message of Christ's soon return is an urgent appeal to each one of us to examine our hearts and evaluate our spiritual lives. It is a call to godly living. There can be no neutrality in the blazing light of the glory of Christ's return. And so to finish the day, read 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 2 to 5, and Hebrews 9, verse 28. What encouragement do these verses give us regarding the manner of Christ's coming? First of all, 1 Thessalonians 5, beginning at verse 2. For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night, while people are saying, Peace and safety? Destruction will come on them suddenly, as labour pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness, so that this day should surprise you like a thief. 
You are children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. And finally, Hebrews 9.28. So Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many, and he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Tuesday, May 14, William Miller and the Bible. Just as God used the Protestant reformers to rediscover the truth about justification by faith in Christ alone, he used William Miller to rediscover the truth about the manner of Christ's second coming. As Miller studied scripture, he discovered a Christ who loved him more than he could possibly imagine. With his pen, a book, and a notebook, he began reading, starting with Genesis, and read no faster than he could understand the passage at hand. By comparing Scripture with Scripture, he allowed the Bible to explain itself. Read Isaiah 28, verses 9 and 10, Proverbs 8, verses 8 and 9, John 16, verse 13, and 2 Peter 1, verses 19 to 21. What principles of Bible interpretation do you discover in these passages? First of all, Isaiah 28, beginning at verse 9. Who is it he is trying to teach? To whom is he explaining his message? To children weaned from their milk? To those just taken from the breast? For it is, do this, do that, a rule for this, a rule for that, a little here, a little there. And then we read in Proverbs 8, verses 8 and 9, All the words of my mouth are just, none of them is crooked or perverse. To the discerning, all of them are right. They are upright to those who have found knowledge. And John 16, verse 13, But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet. To come. And 2 Peter 1 verses 19 to 21. We also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable, and you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. As William Miller compared Scripture with Scripture, the mysteries of the Bible were open to him. He searched as one searching for a hidden treasure, and was richly rewarded. The Holy Spirit opened the Word of God to his understanding. He approached prophecy with the same diligence in Bible study as the other biblical passages he was studying. Read Daniel 1.17, Daniel 2.45, 1 Peter 1.10 1, and 11, and Revelation 1 verses 1 to 3. What do these passages teach us about understanding the prophecies of the Bible. First of all, Daniel 1 verse 17, to these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. And Daniel 2 verse 45, this is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of a mountain, but not by human hands, a rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true, and its interpretation is trustworthy. And 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow, and Revelation 1, verses 1 to 3. The revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known, 
by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw, that is, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of the prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. The symbols in the prophetic books are not locked in mystery. A loving God has given us his prophetic word to prepare us for the climactic events soon to unfold in this world. William Miller clearly understood that prophecy was its own best interpreter. The symbols of prophecy are made clear by the Bible itself. Beasts represent kings or kingdoms, as you read in Daniel 7, verses 17. The four great beasts are four kings that will rise from the earth, but the holy people of the Most High will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever, yes, forever and ever. And then verse 23, he gave me this explanation. The fourth beast is a fourth kingdom that will appear on earth. It will be different from all the other kingdoms and will devour the whole earth, trampling it down and crushing it. Wind represents destruction, as we read in Jeremiah 49 and verse 36, I will bring against Elam the four winds from the four quarters of heaven. I will scatter them to the four winds, and there will not be a nation where Elam's exiles do not go. Water represents peoples or nations, as you read in Revelation 17 verse 15. Then the angel said to me, the waters you saw where the prostitute sits are peoples, multitudes, nations and languages. A woman represents the church. As you read in Jeremiah 6 verse 2, I will destroy daughter Zion so beautiful and delicate and Ephesians 5, 22 to 32. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as you do to the Lord, for the husband is head of the wife as Christ is head of the church, his body of which he is the Saviour. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish but holy and blameless. In this way husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church for we are members of his body. For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. The time prophecies of Daniel and Revelation also are given in symbolic language, with one prophetic day representing one literal year, as we read in Numbers chapter 14 verse 34 for 40 years one year for each of the 40 days you explored the land you will suffer for your sins and know what it is like to have me against you and ezekiel 4 verse 6 after you have finished this lie down again this time on your right side and bear the sin of the people of judah i have assigned you 40 days a day for each year as William Miller applied these principles of biblical interpretation, he was startled at what he discovered regarding what he believed to be the timing of Christ's return. So, to finish today, why is a correct understanding of prophetic symbolism so important for our faith? Wednesday, May 15, the 2,300 days of Daniel 8.14. William Miller observed that events predicted by the prophets were precisely fulfilled. The 400 years of the sojourn of Abraham's descendants, Israel's 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, the 70 years of Israel's captivity, and Daniel's 70 weeks allotted to Israel. And we can read about those in Genesis 15, verse 13. 
First of all, then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that for four hundred years your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and that they will be enslaved and mistreated there. And Numbers 14 verse 34, For forty years, one year for each of the forty days you explored the land, you will suffer for your sins and know what it is like to have me against you. And Jeremiah 25 verse 11, this whole country will become a desolate wasteland and these nations will serve the king of Babylon 70 years. And Daniel 9 24, 70 sevens are decreed for your people and your holy city to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. Read Mark chapter 1, verse 15, Galatians 4, 4, and Romans 5, verse 6. What do these verses tell us about God's timetable for the first advent? Galatians 4, 4, but... When the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law. And Romans 5 verse 6, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. And Mark 1 15, the time has come, he said, the kingdom of God has come near, repent and believe the good news. As Miller studied the prophecies, comparing Scripture with Scripture, he concluded that if God had a divine timetable throughout the Bible, God must have a divine timetable when it comes to our Lord's second coming. Read Daniel 8 verse 14. What event was to occur at the end of the 2,300 days? Daniel 8.14, he said to me, It will take 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary will be reconsecrated. William Miller accepted the popular view that the cleansing of the sanctuary was the purification of the earth by fire. He diligently studied the scriptures to understand an event of such stupendous importance. He discovered the linkage between Daniel 8 and Daniel 9. In Daniel 8, the angel was instructed to make this man understand the vision in Daniel 8 verse 16. By the end of the chapter, the only portion of the entire vision of Daniel 8 left unexplained was the part about the 2,300 days. Daniel 8 27, I, Daniel, was worn out. I lay exhausted for several days. Then I got up and went about the king's business. I was appalled by the vision. It was beyond understanding. Later, the angel returned to Daniel and declared, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand Daniel 9.22. Also, we'll look at Daniel 9.23. As soon as you began to pray, a word went out, which I have come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision and verses 25 to 27, know and understand this. From the time the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the ruler, comes, there will be seven sevens and sixty-two sevens. It will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble. After the sixty-two sevens, the anointed one will be put to death and will have nothing. The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end and desolations have been decreed. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And at the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. This was to help him understand about the 2,300 days. We know this because after bidding Daniel to consider the matter and understand the vision in verse 23, the first words of the angel were, Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city in the following verse, verse 24. 
The word translated determined literally means cut off. Seventy weeks, 490 years are to be cut off. But from what? The vision of the 2,300 days, obviously. The only part of Daniel 8 that Daniel did not understand and that the angel now came to explain. And, since the starting point of the 70 weeks was from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem in verse 25, Miller knew that if he had that date, he could know the beginning of the 70 weeks and the 2,300-day prophecy. Thursday, May 16, the longest prophetic timeline. Read Ezra 7, verses 7 to 13. When was the decree issued to allow Israel's captives in Persia to go free to rebuild their temple? Ezra 7, beginning at verse 7. Some of the Israelites, including priests, Levites, musicians, gatekeepers, and temple servants, also came up to Jerusalem in the seventh year of King Artaxerxes. Ezra arrived in Jerusalem in the fifth month of the seventh year of the king. He had begun his journey from Babylon on the first day of the first month, and he arrived in Jerusalem on the first day of the fifth month, for the gracious hand of his God was on him. For Ezra had devoted himself to the study and observance of the law of the Lord and to teaching its decrees and laws in Israel. This is a copy of the letter King Artaxerxes had given to Ezra the priest, a teacher of the law, a man learned in matters concerning the commands and decrees of the Lord for Israel. Artaxerxes, king of kings, to Ezra the priest, teacher of the law of the God of heaven, Greetings. Now I decree that any of the Israelites in my kingdom, including priests and Levites, who volunteer to go to Jerusalem with you, may go. The decree was issued by Artaxerxes, king of Persia, in 457 BC. This decree was the last of three decrees to allow the Jews to return to rebuild Jerusalem and restore temple worship services. This third decree was the most complete and marks the beginning of the 2,300-day prophecy. Read Daniel chapter 9, verses 25 and 26. When would this entire prophetic period begin? What major events do these verses predict? Daniel chapter 9, beginning at verse 25. Know and understand this, from the time the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the ruler, comes, there will be seven sevens and sixty-two sevens. It will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble. After the sixty-two sevens, the anointed one will be put to death and will have nothing. The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end, and desolations have been decreed. In this remarkable prophecy, Daniel predicted that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem to the Messiah would be 69 prophetic weeks or 483 prophetic days or literal years. Since the decree went forth in the fall of 457 BC, 483 years extend to the fall of AD 27. The word Messiah signifies the Anointed One. In the autumn of AD 27, Christ was baptised and received the anointing of the Spirit, as you read in Acts 10 verse 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. After his baptism, Jesus went into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, The time is fulfilled in Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. 
In the spring of AD 31, in the middle of this last prophetic week, three and a half years after his baptism, Jesus was crucified. The system of offerings that pointed toward the Lamb of God ended with Christ's sacrifice on Calvary. Type had met anti-type, and eventually all the sacrifices and offerings of the ceremonial system ceased. Read Daniel 9.27. How would the 70-week prophecy end? Beginning at verse 27, He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And at the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. The 70 weeks or 490 years, especially allotted to the Jews, ended in AD 34, with the rejection of the Sanhedrin of the Gospel message, as we read in Acts chapter 6, verses 6 through to chapter 7 and verse 60. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. Opposition arose, however, from the members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Cilicia and Asia, who began to argue with Stephen. But they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave him as he spoke. Then they secretly persuaded some men to say, We have heard Stephen speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. So they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. They produced false witnesses who testified, This fellow never stopped speaking against this holy place and against the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen, and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Then the high priest asked Stephen, Are these charges true? To this he replied, Brothers and fathers, listen to me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham while he was still in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran. Leave your country and your people, God said, and go to the land I will show you. So he left the land of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran. After the death of his father, God sent him to this land where you are now living. He gave him no inheritance here, not even enough ground to set his foot on. But God promised him that he and his descendants after him would possess the land, even though at that time Abraham had no child. God spoke to him in this way, For four hundred years your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, God said, and afterward they will come out of that country and worship me in this place. Then he gave Abraham the covenant of circumcision, and Abraham became the father of Isaac and circumcised him eight days after his birth. Later, Isaac became the father of Jacob, and Jacob became the father of the twelve patriarchs. Because the patriarchs were jealous of Joseph, they sold him as a slave into Egypt. But God was with him and rescued him from all his troubles. He gave Joseph wisdom and enabled him to gain the goodwill of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So Pharaoh made him ruler over Egypt and all his palace. Then a famine struck all Egypt and Canaan, bringing great suffering, and our ancestors could not find food. When Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent our forefathers on their first visit. On their second visit, Joseph told his brothers who he was, and Pharaoh learned from Joseph's family. After this, Joseph sent for his father Jacob and his whole family, seventy-five in all. Then Jacob went down to Egypt, where he and our ancestors died. Their bodies were brought back to Shechem and placed in the tomb that Abraham had bought from the sons of Hamor at Shechem for a certain sum of money. As the time drew near for God to fulfil his promise to Abraham, the number of our people in Egypt had greatly increased. 
Then a new king, to whom Joseph meant nothing, came to power in Egypt. He dealt treacherously with our people and oppressed our ancestors by forcing them to throw out their newborn babies so that they would die. At that time Moses was born and he was no ordinary child. For three months he was cared for by his family. When he was placed outside, Pharaoh's daughter took him and brought him up as her own son. Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was powerful in speech and action. While Moses was 40 years old, he decided to visit his own people, the Israelites. He saw one of them being mistreated by an Egyptian, so he went to his defence and avenged him by killing the Egyptian. Moses thought that our people would realise that God was using him to rescue them, but they did not. The next day Moses came upon two Israelites who were fighting. He tried to reconcile them by saying, Men, you are brothers. Why do you want to hurt each other? But the man who was mistreating the other pushed Moses aside and said, Who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? When Moses heard this, he fled to Midian, where he settled as a foreigner and had two sons. After forty years had passed, an angel appeared to Moses in the flames of a burning bush in the desert near Mount Sinai. When he saw this, he was amazed at the sight. As he went over to get a closer look, he heard the Lord say, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Moses trembled with fear and did not dare to look. Then the Lord said to him, Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. I have indeed seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their groaning and have come down to set them free. Now come, I will send you back to Egypt. This is the same Moses they had rejected with the words, Who made you ruler and judge? He was sent to be their ruler, and delivered by God himself, through the angel who appeared to him in the bush. He led them out of Egypt and performed wonders and signs in Egypt at the Red Sea, and for forty years in the wilderness. This is the Moses who told the Israelites, God will raise you up for a prophet like me from your own people. He was in the assembly in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and with our ancestors, and he received living words to pass on to us. But our ancestors refused to obey him. Instead, they rejected him and in their hearts turned back to Egypt. They told Aaron, Make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who led us out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. That was the time they made an idol in the form of a calf. They brought sacrifices to it and reveled in what their own hands had made. But God turned away from them and gave them over to the worship of the sun, moon and stars. This agrees with what is written in the book of the prophets. Did you bring me sacrifices and offerings, forty years in the wilderness, people of Israel? You have taken up the tabernacle of Molech and the star of your god Rephan, the idols you made to worship. Therefore I will send you into exile beyond Babylon." Our ancestors had the tabernacle of the covenant law with them in the wilderness. It had been made as God directed Moses according to the pattern he had seen. After receiving the tabernacle, our ancestors under Joshua brought it with them when they took the land from the nations God drove out before them. It remained in the land until the time of David, who enjoyed God's favour and asked that he might provide a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. But it was Solomon who built a house for him. However, the Most High does not live in houses made by human hands. As the prophet says, Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord, or where will my resting place be? Has not my hand made all these things? You stiff-necked people, your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. You are just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. 
Was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him, you who have received the law that was given through angels, but have not obeyed it. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this, they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. Subtracting 490 years from the 2,300-year prophecy leaves 1,810 years for the completion of the prophecy. This leads us to A.D. 1844. William Miller and the early Adventists believed that the sanctuary in Daniel 8.14 was the earth, and they assumed that Christ would come to purify the earth by fire in 1844. And we're referred here to see the chart on Friday. I'll describe that chart tomorrow as we continue reading this lesson. Friday, May 17, Further Thought Look at the following chart for the prophecies of the 70 weeks and the 2,300 days. The prophecies start in 457 BC and foretell the events surrounding Messiah the Prince, upon whom the 70-week prophecy is grounded. With this solid foundation, the 2,300-day prophecy ends in 1844. Let's look at the chart. The chart starts on the left-hand side of the page. It's going to be a straight line going right across to the right side of the page. It starts at the beginning of the 70 weeks, or the 490 years, in 457 BC. And that 490 years finishes in AD 34. It's titled the 2300 days, or 2300 years. That prophecy began at the same time, 457 BC, and that leaves then 1,810 years, which on the right-hand side of the page brings us to 1844. From the Great Controversy, page 351 and 352, we read, Like the first disciples, William Miller and his associates did not themselves fully comprehend the import of the message which they bore. Errors that had been long established in the church prevented them from arriving at a correct interpretation of an important point in the prophecy. Therefore, though they proclaimed the message which God had committed to them to be given to the world, yet through a misapprehension of its meaning, they suffered disappointment. End of quote. And then on the following page, page 353, we read... Yet God accomplished his own beneficent purpose in permitting the warning of the judgment to be given just as it was. The great day was at hand, and in his providence the people were brought to the test of a definite time in order to reveal to them what was in their hearts. The message was designed for the testing and purification of the church. They were to be led to see whether their affections were set upon this world or upon Christ and heaven. They professed to love the Saviour. Now they were to prove their love. Were they ready to renounce their worldly hopes and ambitions and welcome with joy the advent of their Lord? The message was designed to enable them to discern their true spiritual nature. It was sent in mercy to arouse them to seek the Lord with repentance and humiliation. End of quote. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. One, what lessons can we learn from William Miller's experience? Does God at times overrule our mistaken understanding? Two, 
why is an understanding of Daniel 9, 24-27 so significant in establishing the integrity of the Bible and the divinity of Christ? And three, what role does understanding prophecy play in the plan of salvation? Why is prophecy so significant in the plan of God? And now it's time for Inside Story with Sibylla Harold. Thank you, Sibylla. Unlocking Hearts by F. Edgar Nunes On a recent Sabbath, two Syrian refugees attended the worship services at the Kingston Seventh-day Adventist Church in the Canadian province of Ontario. As the church's pastor, I rejoice at the sight of any visitor. But to be able to welcome a mother and daughter who belong to another world religion was an unexpected privilege. How did they hear about us? Who invited them to our worship service? It turned out that long before they set foot in our church, the Syrian refugees had been befriended by one of the church members, Shirley. Shirley has a big heart for strangers, especially refugees, and she greets people with a warm smile that melts barriers away. She loves to help in any way she can, and people are moved by her kindness and compassion. They readily accept her invitation to family dinners and summer picnics. The Syrian mother and daughter, Iman and Heba, accepted Shirley's invitation to come to church on Sabbath. After the worship service, we visited outside the sanctuary. Iman and Heba seemed happy to talk and readily accepted my offer to pray for them. Afterward, I asked if they would be interested in a copy of the Gospel of John in Arabic printed by the Canadian Bible Society. I won't be offended if you say no, I said. The mother accepted the book. We believe Jesus is a prophet, so we will read the book, she said. A few days later, Shirley called to ask if I spoke Sudanese. I have another family from Africa that I would like you to visit, she said. Shirley's genuine love and warmth for strangers keeps unlocking hearts. Her example inspires us to follow Christ's method. Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. The Saviour mingled with men as one who desired their good. He showed his sympathy for them, ministered to their needs and won their confidence. And then he bade them follow me. A quote from Ellen G. White, The Ministry of Healing, page 143. Shirley mingles with people, listening, serving and showing disinterested love and acceptance, thereby breaking down the most formidable barriers. We also can go from heart to heart as Shirley does every day. Jesus said, By this all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another, in John chapter 13 verse 35 in the New King James Version. The love that reveals we are his disciples is the same power that opens the hearts of strangers and moves them to consider becoming his disciples. This mission story illustrates mission objective number two, to strengthen and diversify Adventist outreach in large cities across the 1040 window among unreached and un- underreached people groups and to non-Christian religions. Go to the website iwillgo2020.org to find out more.